Um, good evening. So I just wanted to welcome you all to our last Peace Studies lecture series, uh, lecture of 2018. Um, it's with great excitement and enthusiasm that I present to you uh, today our guest lecturer, Dr. Mitchell Belfer. Dr. Belfer is president of the Eurogulf Information Center here in Rome. And he is an editor of the Central European Journal of International and Security Studies in Prague, in addition to being a senior lecturer at the Metropolitan University also in Prague. In addition to his numerous works of scholarship, he is also a frequent commentator in the international media sphere and often speaks on Radio France International, among other outlets, and has written for the Wall Street Journal, uh, or for the Wall Street National Review, um, and an assortment of other media. Mitchell has also specialized in the security-related issues present in the Arab Gulf region and wider Mil Middle East, uh, with an emphasis on terrorism and counterterrorism, radical ideologies, small state foreign policy, and geopolitics more generally. So it goes without saying that we are very excited to hear what he has to say in terms of changing geopolitic relations in the Gulf region right now. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome you. Thank you very, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me here. <coughs> is, that, is that working? Yeah. Probably, uh, probably if you push the button. Um, no, but thank you very much for having me here. And uh, when you hear when you hear your name being read out in this way, and with all of those, it, you know, so means that you put the bar very high. It sounds much better and more exotic than it really is. Um, so maybe, if you don't mind, uh, you know, we're dealing with such an important issue today, and I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I think you know, it's such a great, uh, a great program that you have. And uh, you know, welcoming me here to, to speak to you is uh, just, for me, uh, the honor. Um, because I think what you guys are doing and uh, the program that uh, you've put together here is really something very unique and very special. And uh, you know, we try to follow you uh, as much as we can to see how the department's been developing. And, you know, peace studies is something that uh, people often uh, forget, and especially in the field that we look at, terrorism, counterterrorism, or geopolitics, you know, it's, uh, it's a scary world, and you don't usually see the light at the, end of, at the end of the tunnel, but I think through this kind of dialogue, we can actually get to something, um, you know, as a peaceful solution, because in the end, all wars do come to an end, all strife comes to an end, political tensions eventually subside. It's more difficult when you have to live through it, but... I think we keep in mind what the peace will look like uh, instead of always focusing on what the war looks like. I mean, I say that, but I mean, today's discussion is more on the conflict uh, side and the tension side. Although I have to say that um, there are some glints of hope uh, that we start to see in the Middle East as well, in the, in the, in, in, let's say in the Gulf region, which is the focus of today's talk, uh, but in the Middle East. Now, maybe I can, if you don't mind, I'll just tell you a little bit um, just about myself in the sense of uh, the role that we play at the Eurogolf Information Center, because like you in the Peace Studies Department, um, what we're trying to do is build bridges, um, because we ultimately believe in peace as well. We believe that uh, there's no uh, problem that can't be solved um, through dialogue and through discourse and through discussion and through negotiations. Um, we like, or personally I like to remind us of the fact that now in, in our discourses, especially in international politics, we often refer to the idea of a clash of civilizations. And if that's the logic that we want to work from, I can tell you that there's no bigger clash of civilizations that we've had in history than Britain and France. And, you know, if we talk about the Islamic world and Europe and we talk about clashes, we always have to remember that actually our own heritage, our European heritage, comes from a, you know, position of great conflict and tension. Britain and France fought for 800 years. They were of different languages and different religions or different sects. Uh, they had different geopolitical ambitions. They had different geopolitical spheres of influence. They competed with each other. And ultimately, after 800 years, they settled into their peace relations. And that carries on for over a century now. But we can be sure that their time of war far exceeds their times of peace. Um, and so it's, it's important that we don't lose the sight of the fact that actually our own European heritage doesn't come out of peace and tranquility, but comes out of a lot of violence um, and a lot of uh, instability. Now, for us in geopolitics and geopolitical uh, terms, I think it's, it's important for me to kind of lay bare 
a couple of the areas of, uh, not, not yet of focus, but maybe it's uh, important to lay bare some of the concepts that I'm referring to. When I talk about the Middle East in general, it's actually a misnomer. I don't believe, I don't believe in the Middle East. I don't think that it exists. I think it's just a figment and ease of us to define what's not Europe. And so we call it the Middle East. What is it the Middle East of? The middle of the Far East, of course, in our you know, um, po political geographies of the 19th and 18th and 19th centuries, as our cartographers were going around the world and saying, Europe is the center of the world, that's the East and that's the West, and let's figure out what's in between. Um, but if you look at what we refer to the Middle East, that is, i.e. from Western Sahara and Morocco on the Far West, going all the way to Iran, and some people even include Pakistan, by the way, and Central Asian republics, as a wider Middle East. I mean, we're talking about uh, an like, unbelievable amount of cultures and history and different political ambitions, language groups. Um, you know, it's just so rich in its history and its diversity that it's quite a misnomer to refer to it as one region. Now, that said, in geopolitical terms, just like nowadays we refer to something called Europe, we do have to simplify things. So we're not going to name every country or every region within a country individually because what we need to do is try to simplify to the point of it still making sense, um, but not to you know, overcomplicate it either. Now, in relation to the Middle East, I, I like to look at it as, um, I guess, four distinct regions. Uh, you have North Africa. I think North Africa is you know, much uh, more similar to each other, the countries of North Africa, than they are, for example, to the Levant or to, for instance, uh, the Arab the Arab Peninsula and the Arab Gulf region, um, and of course to the, what we call the Northern Tier. We'll get to that in a second. But the first region is uh, North Africa. Uh, that's you know that consists of Morocco. Um, we can put it in, uh, can attach uh, Morocco also to Western Sahara. Um, it also includes, of course, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt. Now, Egypt is one of those pivot states, because from Egypt, it pivots into two other regions. It pivots into um, the Arabian Peninsula, although it's not territorially connected to the Arabian Peninsula. It is connected to it via the Red Sea. Um, and over the Red Sea, so you get to Saudi Arabia. Um, but it also pivots, of course, through um, from Sinai up to Palestine and to Israel. And Israel, of course, that region is the Levant. Uh, so the Levant will include um, Egypt, because it's a pivot state. Um, it will include Palestine, uh, even though Palestine is not yet recognized as an independent country. Um, it still has uh, at least observer status inside the United Nations, and it's recognized by the majority of countries in the region as belonging to the region. So um, even though it's not yet a member state of the United Nations, it's a different topic, by the way. Um, the idea of uh, what is recognition and how recognition is acquired. Um, but for all intents and purposes, we include Palestine. It's an active member of the region, whether it's regarded as a state uh, or not. So you have Egypt, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, going up to Syria and the Levant, uh, sorry, into Lebanon. Um, Syria um, is, of course, again, a little bit of a pivot state. We can call it a minor pivot state in that it bridges, it bridges together the Levant, uh, together with Iraq um, and Turkey. Turkey being one of the northern um, tier states. Uh, again, when we get to Turkey, Iraq, Iran and Syria, we also have Kurdistan. Uh, again, it's a non-recognized non state actor, but nevertheless, the actors in the region regard it in many ways as being a unique although not independent, but a unique actor. And therefore, we should also include it because its national state ambitions are definitely going to change the way the geopolitics is unfolding in the region. And it does do that, by the way. So the, the, the Turks consider um, what Kurdistan is going to do. It all considers what Kurdistan is going to do, and so does Iran, as they develop their regional policies. Um, if they didn't regard it in this way, we, we would probably relegate it to a different type of actor, but it is a kind of state actor. Where, where is Kurdistan? Where is their boundary? Who speaks on behalf of We don't have that yet. That's the problem. Um, uh, it's how a, do you speak on behalf of a country that's not existing? I will address that question later. 
but, okay. but uh, what we need to do is consider it as an active actor in the region, even if not all of the elements of its statehood have been established yet, like Palestine. Um, then if you move um, into that northern tier, you have your Turkey, you have your Kurdistan, ill-defined in its boundaries, but still active. You have Iraq, and you have Iran. Now, going southbound, Iraq becomes, in this regard, another point of pivot, because Iraq bleeds you from the northern tier into the Arabian, um, into the Arabian Peninsula. And that part of the Middle East, and what we're referring to in this way, is the Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Oman, uh, Yemen. And so these, am I missing one? Um, I think I'm not. No? Kuwait. I, I said Kuwait. But, uh, but in any case, thank you for reminding me again. Um, yes, and so essentially, even though this is still a simplification, because these countries all have their own unique histories and heritage, they all have their own political um, interests, um, they have their own power balance. But nonetheless, I think if we do break the Middle East and North Africa down into these kind of four succinct regions, um, distinct regions, um, we're, we're able to understand the way that geopolitics has been unfolding and we're able to understand the way that politics in general unfolds in the region. So um, I think for our, I mean, there's, uh, we could spend, and usually we do spend, not only hours and days and weeks and months, but years looking at all the political dynamics that are involved in this. But for today, and for what I would like to focus on particularly, is the changes to the geopolitics of the region. Now, what do we mean by geopolitics? Um, there are also, I mean, I know, I have you for such a short period, and I'm going to machine gun my way through all of these kind of concepts. But for us today, and what I'll be looking at is the, the more classical geopolitics. It's the geopolitics of, um, you know, the, the kind of colder, more calculating, uh, political, um, decision-making, your cost-benefit analysis on the basis of uh, your material interest and your material gains or your material security. Um, so we're going not to be looking at the ideational factors, we're not going to be looking at issues related to Islam or competing <coughs> versions of Islam, we're not going to look at sectarianism. Um, although there's a geopolitical dimension to sectarianism and to all of these uh, features of the Middle East, we're going to be looking strictly at cost-benefit analysis on the basis of alliance formation, alliance capabilities, military capabilities, um, and interests. Because here we're going to perhaps get to um, uh, understand from a more cold and calculating way um, why states behave the way they do. And in this way, even though I personally um, don't consider myself to be just a cold realist, I, I do like in my work especially in the work that we do on counterterrorism, to look at uh, drivers of radicalization, and radicalization will play a role, but in a very geopolitical way. Um, even though that's my, that, that's my main uh, life vision, let's say, to look at the political psychology, both of individual actors and so social actors, as well as states, for today's lecture, we're going to look at the state level and state level uh, uh, security and the way that states are able to, de to develop their security but also to look at the way that um, capabilities determine, i.e. in a realist fashion. Um, Bahrain, for example, as being the region's smallest country, um, has a very different take on security than, for example, Saudi Arabia or Iran. Uh, Iran has you know, 85 to 87 million people. It's a huge territory. It's got a huge military. The military is something like three times the size of Bahrain's total population. So you can't really do a comparison um, in, a, in a, like, let's say, as even actors. They're not, they're not even in power. But that doesn't mean that they're not even in, let's say, uh, the fact that they belong to the international community. And so we'll look at them and the different strategies that they've developed because they are very different in their power distribution. Like, what are they, what's the old saying? Uh, birds of feather flock together. Um, in other words, you know, not only ideologically, that if you are of one denomination, you usually tend to come together, but also power um, creates re special relationships. Countries that are seen as being of equal power um, tend to have you know, a certain uh, recognition by others, sometimes disagreed on, of course, but there's a tendency to view them 
as some kind of sovereign equal. And the sovereign equality principle, I think, is, uh, is quite important in our, in our world, especially as we're facing all these types of crises. Many of those crises are also crises of sovereignty. And, you know, just to return to the issue of Palestine or the issue of Kurdistan in this, it's not so much a question of boundaries as it is a question of sovereignty. And countries do try to prevent others from having their sovereignty. When it comes to, to Palestine, of course, Israel, and previously Israel, Egypt, and Jordan all prevented the rise of Palestine as an independent actor. Um, when it comes to Kurdistan, so Turkey and Iran, to an extent Iraq, are preventing the rise of uh, Kurdistan as a sovereign actor. So sovereignty does play a role, but geopolitics also is important, and that's what I think we can focus our analysis on. Now, the interesting thing about the Middle East, and just to kind of raise the issue, is that power is not very attractive in the Middle East. Powerful countries don't attract allies to it. In fact, they push allies to form against them. So in this world, you don't have a tendency towards um, uh, bandwagoning. Do you guys know the concepts of balancing versus bandwagoning? Mm -hmm. So very, very quickly, because actually my background is as a uh, scholar of alliances, um, so I'll tell you in very, uh, in a very, very quick uh, fashion. But there are two main prototypes of alliances that are formed, you know, globally and historically. One is called the balance or the balancing alliance, and the other is called the bandwagoning alliance. The balance, uh, the balancing alliance, is literally when there is a source of danger, the other countries will get together against the source of danger. Yeah, and then this way they can balance against the ambitions of the hegemonic or the growing hegemonic power. So that's your typical balancing alliance. For example, to leave the Middle East, when you had the rise of Nazi Germany, you had those countries like Britain and France and America that jo and Soviet Union that joined forces to balance against the power of Nazi Germany. Yeah? They didn't join Nazi Germany, they, they joined each other against Nazi Germany. The bandwagoning alliance is the opposite. Instead of uh, joining forces against the source of danger, you decide to join the source of danger or the stronger actor in the international or regional system. So, in other words, um, instead of going against them, you think that you're going to benefit more by joining that source of power. It's not always danger in the negative, but it's danger for the stability of the region. So, those countries that join Nazi Germany, for example, um, you know, Japan or Romania or Hungary, I would say Italy, but um, Mussolini was more of the, inspira the, the inspiration for the Nazis um, and their alliance was kind of given before the war began. Um, but those countries that when they saw the war on the horizons, countries like Romania and countries like Hungary, they decided to join the source of uh, danger. Those countries are typically bandwagon. Now the Middle East, it confounds us as a region because this doesn't work. The logic of balancing and bandwagoning just don't work. Um, you get limited balancing against perceived sources of danger. For example, when Israel emerged as the single greatest power, military power, versus Egypt, which was many times larger than it, or versus uh, Syria and um, Jordan in the, 19, in the 1967 conflict, it didn't attract such a strong balance to provide um, uh, let's say, uh, a, a better chance for the Arab states to be victorious in the future. In fact, what you had was a reduction. So, in the 1973 war, less countries came to balance against the power of Israel than they had in 1967. So, you had a decrease. But at the same time, those countries don't join Israel to, ba to bandwagon with it. They don't look at Israel as a source of power. They look at Israel in a different manner. So, what you have in the Middle East is dysfunction on in terms of uh, alliance formation. Alliances don't work. Iran is not attracting countries to it. Turkey is not attracting countries to it. So what you see is in fact that those countries have to look outside of their region for allies. Turkey has NATO. Um, Iran is now working closely with, with Russia. Um, you don't have the kind of polarity that you would have, for example, in, in a European, in a Latin American, or even in a Far East Asian um, political environment. So when we do the comparison, we have to figure out what's going on in the Middle East and what kind of alliances have been formed and which ones haven't been formed and why they're being formed. So what are the main challenges that we've been facing? Now, in geopolitical terms, there's a number of 
symptoms and causes. So symptoms, for example, of com uh, symptoms of the of the challenges that we face are conflicts, for example, like in Yemen. Yemen is not the cause of a conflict. Yemen, and it's something that we can talk about perhaps more during the uh, question and answer period, Yemen is a symptom. For people who believe that Yemen is simply the result of you know, Saudi-Iranian competition, it's an overstatement. It's not only. That would assume that if there was no Saudi-Iranian competition, then Yemen would be in peace. Yemen has not been in peace. Yemen um, had a civil war. They had a civil war between Republicans and, and uh, socialists. Um, they had a civil war previously on the basis of tribe and identity. Um, Yemen, Yemen's biggest problem, biggest problem, not only problem, is um, how governance can work inside of Yemen. The outside actors, whether they're regional or whether they're international, only add to the dimensions and the dynamics of the country. They are not the cause of it. So it's important for us to eliminate at the very beginning some of our biases in terms of cause and effect, cause and effect. So in this way, what, what, what you see is that um, a country like Iran sees an opportunity to put pressure on, on uh, Saudi Arabia, but Iran doesn't create all of the conditions that led to the conflict. Saudi Arabia sees a potential of exerting more influence, but it does not cause the problem. That problem existed, and that problem is about governance. Governance matters. Government, governance matters from one side of the Middle East to the others. It's the government and the way and the, the structure of your governing system that determines what you recognize as a geopolitical interest. If you don't have that, um, and you don't have a government that recognizes it, actually your interests kind of go everywhere and you have a very haphazard approach to government and to, uh, to politics. I'll give you an example. I mean, uh, a country like Kuwait, it's a very interesting uh, country, um, and Kuwait, of course, has been sitting on oil forever. Um, they've had oils, you know, it's not like they invented it now um, and you have to do a magic potion. It's literally under the territory. But it took until the 1930s to recognize um, what that meant in terms of economy and economic development, in terms of a role to play in international politics. And from there, you, you know, Kuwait develops um, its strategic thinking on the basis of it being a major oil producer. All the oil producer countries are like that. So you need to have, however, a government that's able to recognize the geopolitical impact or the importance of the kind of resources that you have um, and through that to develop the relationships that you're going to kind of uh, build up. So um, I think, th I mean, I, I'm not going to go country by country in this, but it is important to, to recognize the importance of governance. Now, what you have in, throughout the Middle East are essentially overlapping and competing forms of governance. Um, in some cases, you have the revolutionary governments, you have a revolution in the Islamic Revolution in Iran, you had the Ba'athist revolutions uh, in Iraq, uh, in, uh, of course in the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, you had in Syria a revolutionary regime, you've had a revolutionary regime in Egypt, Libya, um, and at the same time, and living in the same spaces, you also have the hereditary monarchies. As an empirical fact, the monarchies are considerably more stable. You don't have the, you know, kind of uh, coup d'etat um, systems that you do basically one year after the next uh, in the Middle East that is trying to be revolutionary states. It's an empirical fact that there's a greater stability and, um, oh, what's, uh, sorry, I'm losing a, a term, um, succession, thank you. The succession of one government to the next um, is much more stable in the monarchies. It's not to say that, um, the, the, that all the monarchies are going to function perfectly, they have their own sets of problems, but as an empirical fact they are much more stable and they're not prone to the kind of outbursts of political violence that you get in the non-monarchical the non systems within the Middle East. Um, it, again, it's not to say that we should now turn the clock back on all of the revolutionary states, but we should keep it in mind that um, they have prioritized their interests very differently. So if you look at it on a, on a strictly empirical, on a strictly um, alliance formation um, level, what you will see is that the kind of alliances that monarchies develop are alliances that we call status quo supportive. 
they are very um, aware of the fact that they live in a region in which other types of governments exist. And those other types of governments tend to be more revolutionary. So they try to develop their geopolitical interests on the basis of status quo. They tend not to intervene, at least militarily and directly, into the affairs of other countries because they are terrified of that blowing back um, on them. So, for instance, you've never heard of the United Arab Emirates invading one of its neighbors. Um, you've never heard of the Qataris invading one of their neighbors, um, or, for example, of you know the um, Bahrain sailing sailing ships over to invade Iran or crossing the water into Saudi Arabia. Um, those small Gulf countries, for instance, are very, very status quo. They don't want things to change. Saudi Arabia is also status quo. The Saudis do get involved um, in a limited fashion in some of the, the conflicts around them, they do, but the reason for that is not because they're looking for territorial gains or to try to inspire other countries to be like them. They do it in what you would call defensive revisionism or defensive uh, in a defensive manner. They are revising in some ways what's occurring around them. They're trying to change it a little bit, but only to reinforce you know, their defensive position or their status quo at home. So it's not to say that they will only be you know, supporting the status quo. Sometimes they will support other types of uh, behaviors, but the reason for that is to be stable at home. That's their main priority. Um, Morocco is another good example of this. Morocco has been involved, of course, in Western Sahara, uh, Western Sahara de facto is under their sovereignty at this moment, um, but it tends also not to get involved into other conflicts, including, by the way, in Algeria. They have a, a hot and hard border, but Morocco is not trying to inspire conflict and tensions within, within Algeria. They basically just put up the wall, and they don't want to let anybody in or out um, in, in that regard. Um, alternatively, what we've seen especially in the past 50 years, is that the revolutionary states are all very keen to export their revolution. So the Islamic revolution of Iran exports to Bahrain, to Saudi Arabia, into Iraq, into Syria, into, of course, Lebanon, and they try to export it so that you create states that are in the image of Tehran. Iraq, under Saddam, did the same thing. They tried to create Ba'athism, and of course, Ba'athism, you know, um, linked up in some way uh, Iraq and Syria, uh, they of course split and went into two different forms of Ba'athism. Um, but nonetheless, even that, this form of uh, Arab socialism as a revolutionary movement was intended to proliferate. You know, Nasser tried to proliferate pan-Arabism. Um, Algeria tries to proliferate in its region. Libya tries to proliferate in its region under Gaddafi. So essentially what you have are two very contrasting forms of governance that are producing two very different forms of geopolitics. So one is going to form alliances of aggression and others are going to form alliances of, of uh, retention and of, uh, of defense. Um, and that's of course producing the, the world that we live in today. Um, we, bear with me first, because that's the world we have been living in, but it's crumbling. The world that we and grew up and we knew the world of kind of uh, more stable alliances, the world in which the Gulf Cooperation Council existed or Turkey was a, a really strong and contributing member of NATO. Um, the idea that, for example, Russia would treat Iran instrumentally but not strategically. Um, all of those issues are basically rapidly transforming. Um, Turkey is no longer a reliable member of NATO. Uh, and has gone its own way and has its own ambitions. Um, if you look at the way that um, the GCC has changed, um, the Gulf Cooperation Council um, was formed in 1981 after it was determined that uh, Iran had attempted to have a coup d'etat in Bahrain and to overthrow the government there by killing main people within the government. Um, that is, you know, that's what brought the six Gulf Cooperation Council countries together. They recognized an exogenous threat. They were going to try to balance against it. That's probably the only um, working case of a balancing alliance uh, in the Middle East. But even that, what we see from 2017, is coming to an end. So the system of the Middle East that we knew um, is basically unfolding in a way 
that we um, are trying to anticipate but are unable to predict. Um, and maybe as a caveat to that, um, it's important to note that the Middle East also has, it's not just the Arab, the Arab countries, and it's really important to put that into, into a perspective. Um, if you look at this kind of historic relationship between Israel, uh, Iran, and especially Israel and Turkey, but also Israel and Iran, because people forget it now that Israel and Iran are deep enemies, but before 1979, Israel and Iran were very close allies. In fact, Iran was the first country to recognize uh, the first, uh, well, Muslim, maybe though, oh, no, Turkey was the second, it was the first country to recognize uh, Israel and to build an embassy in Tehran. Um, so it was only after 1979 that they changed direction and they started to be competitors. But if we think about it in the big picture, those three countries as being non-Arab um, and or non-Muslim, they form their own unique kind of approach to Middle Eastern politics. And until today, um, none of them really belong to the big Middle Eastern movements, uh, be it pan-Arabism, even the, uh, you know, the kind of uh, strategic alliances that are being formed there. Um, none of them are really invited to participate um, in them. So it's important that they're, it, to note there that they are active and they are members of the region, but they are not participants in these kind of alliance structures. Um, sorry, I, am I good on time? More or less, yeah. So, in this way, I think it's uh, perhaps important to note the kind of new alliances that are being formed because our old alliances either don't exist um, or um, uh, no longer exist or they're breaking apart. Um, and so, we have essentially what I wanted to present to you um, are essentially three alliances that are coming into their existence or have been born in the past three or four years and are coming to be mature. Uh, so that we can also discuss perhaps um, a little bit about what the implications are of those alliances. Um, and then I'm going to put a plus one at the end because it's one type of alliance that works against what we're thinking as the norm of some kind of regional integration. So the first, the first um, alliance that I wanted to bring up today that is in its budding phase, it it's, uh, was established in 2015 uh, under the direction of Saudi Arabia, it's called the Islamic Military Counterterrorism Coalition, the IMCTC. It's a mouthful, but it's a very important uh, alliance. Basically, um, I won't go through the whole list of um, countries that are there, but it's it's a it's a big it's a big list of Muslim uh, countries that are participating in this counter um, radicalization or this uh, counterterrorism coalition. The alliance itself is a response. So basically it's a reaction, and the reaction was uh, to the declaration that Arab states were not doing enough by 2015 to combat the rise of ISIS, um, to combat the rise of Daesh, um, and to turn back um, in almost all Muslim countries internal radicalization. So there had been a push from the Europeans and from the United States that was suggesting that the Arab and the Muslim countries um, were allowing a festering of radicalization to take place in their country, and that was spilling over uh, somehow into Europe. And because they weren't doing enough, there was pressure mounting on them. So the Saudis um, reacted to that, and they established this uh, Islamic Military Counterterrorism Coalition. Um, this is, you know, it's, it's a coalition, so it's not a strict pyramidical alliance. It's more of a horizontal alliance, and countries are kind of free to join and to contribute as much as they can, when they can, uh, in the fight. But as a result of this, what we've had and what we've seen is concerted efforts by the various members under the flag of this counterterrorism uh, counter coalition to combat both radicalism and fight terrorism on the ground. So you're getting the two sides of the, of, of the uh, struggle. So for example, countries like Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates have become really specialists in interdicting terror finance, for example. Uh, whereas Jordan is very um, supportive of the intelligence gathering and helps with uh, military operations. Um, and on the other hand, you also get organizations like in Saudi Arabia called Etidal, which are working very, very closely with uh, European and other Western uh, agencies at um, locating and uh, vulnerable Muslim communities abroad and helping to de-radicalize them. So you're getting, um, in, in this alliance, you're getting the two sides of the struggle. 
uh, how successful it's going to be is anybody's guess. Um, but it's important, I think, to remember that as a coalition, there's much more flexibility. You don't have a single leadership. You don't necessarily have a, you know, a, um, a single pooling of resources like you would in NATO, but rather each country and each uh, a grouping of countries within that is able to contribute as they think they can do best. And because it is a problem that's not only facing the Arab countries or the, the Islamic countries, um, but it's facing uh, Europe, the United States, and other regions beyond it, um, this can actually be very attractive, um, you know, for instance, um, to, to the outside world. So already, you're not just talking, by the way, of Arab countries, you have uh, Senegal, Sierra Leone, uh, you have also, uh, for example, uh, Pakistan belongs to it. So you're getting really different regions are participating. Um, and it, it's, it's uh, you know, all things considered quite transparent. Um, and they bring in observers also from uh, Europe and from the United States. So I think in this way, it's, it's, um, it's, a pretty, it's, it's, it's a pretty good initiative, a strong initiative. It started off very well. Uh, I think the hope is that it's going to be able to retain its momentum and really work and continue to work at fighting against this kind of radical, uh, radical identities uh, that are that have been formed and, and fermented in these countries. So um, that is one, I think, alliance or coalition that's uh, really worth um, looking into to see how it's going to evolve over time. The second one that I wanted to raise today um, is still just a piece of paper. It's not yet done anything. Uh, actually, it's not even really been properly form, uh, formatted. And this is what's called uh, MESA, yeah? and it's called the Middle East Strategic Alliance. And MESA is something that was, um, basically it's res resulted um, from 2017, so from last year, from the Islamic American Summit. Uh, the alliance is not yet operational, but the intention is to try to create an Arab NATO. So they take a look at the NATO example. NATO, of course, remember it's, um, it didn't come naturally. Um, it came basically on the backs of the victorious uh, allies in World War II. Um, then it extends to ensure, kind of uh, similar to the establishment of the European Union, but this is in security affairs, uh, to ensure, uh, what was the, there was a statement at the beginning by the first, by uh, uh, the very first Secretary General of NATO, NATO was being formed to keep the Americans in Europe, uh, to keep the Germans down, and to keep the Russians out. Um, that was essentially the program of, uh, of NATO. So it wasn't exactly, you know, peace, love, and justice. Um, it was also about strategically understanding the way that politics was working at the time. And so MESA, in some ways, is set, if we don't get the GCC crisis right uh, and solve it, it's going to replace the GCC. Um, you're not going to have an overlapping alliance. Uh, what you're going to have instead is the core of the alliance being formed, for example, around um, Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE, Bahrain, uh, possibly Egypt, Jordan, and possibly Kuwait. Um, there'll be options for other countries to join later on. There's even the indication that the United States would at least start off as an observation country, uh, but you know it's all still up in the air. What's not up in the air is the fact that uh, these, the countries that I just mentioned have seen the need for deepening their strategic uh, cooperation. Um, these countries are starting to recognize shared interests, shared threat perception. Um, they're starting to recognize, if they haven't done so already, um, the, the, the concepts of smart security being in their interest. Smart security being um, that you uh, use basically um, uh, the assets that you have and you're able to coordinate the assets that you have between your allies rather than every country developing assets independently for themselves. So for example, if Saudi Arabia has a strong air force, there's no reason for the UAE to also build a strong air force. They'd be able to coordinate and um, cooperate on such a level that um, the Emirates and Saudi Arabia would be able to share their assets and not you know, basically double everything. This way they'd be able to contribute to their own unique ways. Um, in some ways, the counter-terrorism alliance or coalition uh, does that by allowing countries to hone and to perfect the skills that they're good at in countering terrorism. Um, the difference, of course, with MISA is that MISA is supposed to create a structured alliance. MISA is supposed to create a kind of headquarters and a communication system 
and a control system so that the interoperability of the alliance is started from the beginning. And of course, like the um, Atlantic uh, Treaty and like the Atlantic Charter, uh, you would have a collective security uh, mechanism inside which, you know, Article 5 of the Atlantic Charter reads that an attack on one member state is equivalent to an attack on all the member states. And so what you'll see uh, in the development of MISA is, is, is a f uh, the formation of that around a kind of a bud um, of an alliance inside. So I think we'll be hearing a lot more of this in the year to come. Um, I know this year in the Manama Dialogues, uh, they discussed this in some depth. Um, about how to develop a MISA and the need for a MISA. And I support that very much. I think that it's the, you know, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of having a stable structured alliance in the heart even of an unstable region. Um, we in Europe lived in um, a very unstable region and really it was so unstable until we had these larger structured alliances that basically helped, um, you know, the smaller countries to negotiate with one another in a in a framework, um, and so I, I really put a lot of uh, a lot of emphasis on the institutional solutions to, to conflicts and crises, and the institutions that we developed in Europe certainly assisted in that. Um, we've been living in the longest period of peace uh, that we've ever really known, um, and so and and I do put institutions at the heart of that. Um, so let's see, um, we can keep our um, we can keep our fingers crossed or hold our breath. Um, and, and see how this develops, but I really believe that it's, it's the right way forward. Um, the last coalition that I wanted to talk about, as, or the last alliance, that seems to be um, worthwhile to talk about because it started strong and now slowly it's somehow being reduced, um, and that's the Arab coalition in Yemen. Um, because, again, to talk about Yemen, Yemen's problems are not related, for example, to the coalition that's fighting there. Yemen's problems are very deep. Yemen's problems are mostly about governance inside of Yemen and the relationship between govern uh, and governing uh, classes there. Um, but that said, the coalition that is uh, fighting there and the war that's being fight, fought there is a very brutal war. I mean, it's a, a personal war. It's a war between um, people, you know, and, and it, it has a tribal dimension to it. It has a family dimension to it. It has, you know, a sectarian dimension to it. Um, and of course, there are actors outside of the Yemen that are making sure that the embers are burning in. But there's, there's also something to be said about the multi-dimensional side. It's not just, you know, the, the, the governments. And of course, um, for those who know, the government, the Hadi government there is supported by the Arab coalition. Uh, so Saudi Arabia and the UAE, Bahrain, these countries are supporting the, the legitimate government, the UN-backed government. Um, the, the Houthis are the ones, two, uh, three years ago, that uh, basically pushed the government out of Sana'a and to Aden. And so what you have are now the, the unfolding, kind of wider geopolitical conflict in the Middle East unfolding in Yemen. Um, that's a symptom of the problems of Yemen, it's not the cause of it. Um, but be that as it may, what you've seen is that um, because the, the Saudis are willing to engage and the Emiratis in an air campaign, but they're not willing as yet to put boots on the ground. Instead, what you've seen is that they support the boots on the ground of the UN government um, that's been there and the UN-backed military that's there. Um, but that military is quite small. In fact, the Houthi government, which is supported by, or the Houthi militiamen, which is supported by Iran, their army is considerably larger than the military forces of the actual government. Government military force is about 10,000 strong. The Houthi is about 35,000 strong in terms of battlefield positioning now. I mean, the whole military of the Yemenese government is about 40,000 40, and the Houthi is about uh, 60,000, something like this. It's a, it's a strange balance, but it, doesn't, it does not favor the government. It favors the, the Houthi, the rebels. And so what the Saudis are trying to do is to recalibrate that by using their air force. But, I mean, as a lesson learned, wars are not typically won by exerting air power. Um, air force is good at diminishing um, your, your opponent's capabilities, but you don't really hold, you can't hold ground from it. So um, if, when Saudi Arabia changes its policy and begins to be more active in the, uh, let's say, on the ground or of other countries, 
or UN, for example, want to be more active in holding ground. So maybe we'll begin to see, you know, let's say the tilting of the balance of the restoration of the UN-backed government. But until then, it remains kind of up in the air. So the alliance itself is unwilling to carry out the full operational uh, means that would be necessary to complete the mission. Um, it's just not willing to get kind of dragged into Yemen because, frankly, they know that Yemen's, um, like I said before, Yemen's problems are bigger um, than it, and so they're, they're kind of afraid of it. So um, that's the third alliance um, that I think needs to be discussed because it's, it's also going to have longer-term implications in the geopolitics of the region. And finally, the last thing I want to say, the plus one, um, is in relation to um, Qatar, because um, we talked a lot about Qatar, um, let's say, in our public discourses. Um, Qatar is the reason why the GCC is uh, basically in suspension. Um, some of Qatar's behaviors and its actions against even its own neighbors um, led those neighbors to basically suspend relations to it. Now, in some ways, what the Qataris have done since are a little bit more tricky than what they had done before. So, for instance, the, the Qataris have been uh, warming up very closely, not only with Iran, but also with Turkey, um, in a way that will make it very difficult for Qatar to rejoin the region or to rejoin um, the GCC as an equal partner. For example, the Qataris opened up a Turkish naval and military base inside of Qatar. Um, that military base will have about 60,000 Turkish soldiers. That's huge. And that's a game changer in the wider geopolitics of the region. If Turkey now is going to have a, uh, a stake of some 60,000 soldiers in the Arab Gulf um, and you know, facing down the, um, the Saudis just across the border, this is going to pose a serious strategic challenge to the Saudis. And it gets the Saudis thinking quite in a different strategic, innovative way. Um, actually, the Saudis came up with this policy. At the beginning, I thought it was a little absurd. But as I think about it more and more, um, if I was a Saudi uh, government official, I would do exactly the same thing. And that is to build a trench, a waterway between Qatar and Saudi Arabia. At the beginning, when we heard this, you know, everybody was kind of giggling about it. You know, they're going to turn Qatar into an island. That was the idea. Um, but actually, if you think about it from a strictly cold geopolitical um, manner, so Turkey, for example, now will have a base of 60,000 soldiers. How are they able to affect Saudi Arabia? Well, they would have to drive over the border. But what if there was no border to drive over? It would be much more difficult for Turkey to be able to exert any kind of pressure. This is purely hypothetical. But it would be much more difficult for Turkey to exert any kind of real pressure on uh, Saudi Arabia if they had to go by sea. Because at sea, um, both the Emirates and the um, Saudis have considerably stronger uh, capabilities than Turkey does. Turkey is a land power. Turkey requires ground in order to move its forces over. So if you deny them the ground, actually what you're doing is being able to put the security into your hands rather than uh, reacting all the time to what Turkey would do. So Qatar, by inviting Turkey into the region, has basically changed the balance um, of power and the calculation amongst many of the countries as to the eventual return of Qatar to the fold and the reliability of it as an alliance partner uh, into the future. The same with its relationship, by the way, with uh, Tehran, with Iran. Because instead of looking at Tehran still suspiciously, what the Qataris did is they immediately engaged in a very, very deep level with them. And that is only going to create further tensions and drive you know, these traditional allies who were for so long close together and working together, it's only going to drive them further apart. And so again, um, as what Qatar and how Qatar has uh, positioned itself from being a, a contributor and a security uh, to the security provisions of the wider Arab uh, Gulf, uh, what they're ending up doing is uh, now that the crisis has entered its second year, um, they're actually working against the security provisions by inviting the external actors to base themselves uh, or support those countries in their positions in the region. I guess the only thing that's missing now is Qatar's relationship to Israel, uh, but we'll see how that how it develops it uh, into the future. So I think uh, that's enough from me for this uh, briefing. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, answer whatever questions you may have, and uh, I thank you for your attention.